and popped 
fingered hands that fell below its kneecaps made no attempt to move the obstacles in front of it. Its long neck was the most inhumane part of its anatomy. If it was a regular sized model, I'd assume someone had borrowed it from a horse or a similarly shaped animal. Despite the goofy looking nature of its neck, I could quickly tell its purpose was to allow the thing a much better range of movement to aid in its search for whatever it was looking for. This was made all the easier by the fact that it emitted two bright beams of light from its eyes that illuminated the woods below it. Silly as it sounds, it was like the thing had built-in searchlights that it used to scan every tiny being under its unrelenting gaze. By some miracle, the skeleton was a good enough distance away from me that it either hadn't noticed my presence or didn't care enough to inspect me. That being said, I was effectively pinned down. Suppose I wanted to get in my car and drive off. In that case, that required me going into the cabin, finding my keys, starting my car, turning on my headlights, and manually opening a decently sized steel gate just down the road. There were enough steps in my head that I could very well alert it to my position, and in an emergency, maybe I could plow through the gate. Still, considering the potential damage to my car, it may not have been usable to outrun the giant to the highway. Secondly, if I'm being honest, seeing that monster made me do frightened to move any part of my body anyway. Some of you may call me a coward, and that's fair, but when that early hominid part of your brain that saved our ancestors from cave lions and birds big enough to snatch children away from you tells you to stay put, you stay put. Unfortunately, in staying put, I damn near almost lost my hearing when the skeleton opened its mouth and emitted what sounded like a profoundly distorted mule deer call. It searched around a small area for about 10 minutes, calling out at different frequencies. All this before, I kid you not, I sneezed. It stopped in the middle of its call, waited a couple seconds, and briefly switched to what sounded like a child on a loud intercom and said, Hello. I felt my heart drop as the twisted puzzle pieces came together. Before I knew it, my hands were glued to my nose and mouth, fearing that the slightest breath would send it over to me in a frenzy. It took a single step in my direction and flashed those demonic eyes over my property. Luckily, the cabin blocked me from the wretched light, but I had clearly piqued its interest and it was easily tall enough that it would be able to see me on the other side if I got close enough. It took another cautious step towards me, and a lower frequency repeated its inhuman question. Hello? At that moment, I knew I had to make a decision. Part of me was convinced there was a good chance that I would die, but that good chance would be a certainty if I didn't act. My only real shot at survival was running into my cabin, finding my keys within a few seconds, and making a mad dash to my car. I'd have to hope that even after smashing through the gate, my car would have enough to get me into town. It was a poor gamble, and all in all, I'd be giving up the one safety net I had and allowing it to know exactly where I was. Still, anything had to be better than the thing tiptoeing its way here, seeing me anyway, and turning me a into a paste in its maggot-filled throat. Fighting every urge to run into the woods and hide under a rock, I summoned the mental energy to prepare for what was coming next. Cursing myself in my mind, I slowly and quietly turned toward the door to begin a race for my life. But just as I had done so, I heard a groan in the distance. To my surprise, it sounded like that of an actual mule deer. The skeleton must have picked up on the noise at the same time. Its long neck immediately snapped in the direction of the sound. Its wretched searchlight eyes. 
in the open. I made a quick call to 911 to try and explain them what happened and request that they send as many units as possible out to me immediately. But as expected, they essentially thought I was on drugs and suggested that whatever I saw couldn't hurt me and just sleep it off. Text my friends aren't going through because of this terrible service. Try not to break down from the frustration I began typing this. At this point, all I can think to do is write up the story detailing my experience and post it online in hopes that my internet miraculously works and that one of you can contact someone who believes me and sends help. Oh, and in case it kills me, keep a final testament to my last few hours on Earth. The least I can do is let the people that care about me know that I didn't go crazy out here or get eaten by a bear. If anyone has any ideas what I'm dealing with, please give the information I'm missing. I'm, in sh I'm unsure if there are similar stories around Lassen or if this is a first, but I need to know what's out there if I'm going to survive the night. Here's hoping. Once again, this isn't just a joke for your entertainment. I'm not trying to scare anyone or be the center of some urban legend. I'm just a really scared guy who's desperate for someone to believe him. And I'm begging everyone that reads this, please help me. Do you think he got help? What do you think it was? Alright, the next story is called Curse of the Bear Paw by N.E. Moon. I never understood why my father brought it home with him. I was entering college at the time, and the week before I departed on my seven-hour car ride to Maine, my dad went on a hiking trip to one of our state parks. I often went with him as a child, but I didn't really have the time or the want to spend an entire weekend out in the forest before uprooting our entire livelihood. I remember him walking through the front door that Monday. He had quite the sunburn on him. And he had this big smile on his face, maybe because he knew it would freak out mom or because of the nature of it, but as we greeted him, he had in his outstretched hand a Ziploc bag, and in that bag was a small collection of bones. Mom screamed and immediately started cursing him for bringing a biohazard into the home. He winked at me as he tried to calm mom down and asked me, know what this is, son? I shook my head. I was going to school for physical therapy, which is where I believe his excitement came from. This is a genuine, fossilized bear paw. He shook the baggie at me. I took the corner of the bag carefully between my fingertips. It looked about like what you'd expect. It wasn't completely, though. There were three small digits attached to what would have been the base of the paw. The bear wasn't that old was smaller than my hand. It had a unique yellow color and looked very porous with the small indents covering its surface. It gave off an aura of what I could only describe as strangeness. How do you know this is from a bear? I asked him. He went on to describe all of his self-taught knowledge of how the ends of the digits ended with sharper points indicating that it had claws and how the density of it would correspond with the weight of a heavy animal. I could tell that my mom and I were both listening with that much confidence in what he was saying. He moved on, ignoring our glances at one another, and started to show us the few photos that he took. He made sure to stop to get the photos printed before coming home. He showed us the waterfall where he found the paw in the first place and the campsite he made for himself. Soon, after some more rambling, that was the end of it. We moved on and he placed the paw in his office, keeping it hidden in a trunk until he could get a display for it. My mother, father, and brother all tried to enjoy the last few days that I would be home. There was a sadness in the air that loomed over our heads with each passing day, but even still, that was the greatest week of my life with my family. I'd do anything to go back to that week to stop my father from ever going out in the first place. I drove off the main a week later with a tearful goodbye from all of them. I was excited. There was a whole future ahead of me at that very moment. I didn't know it would come tumbling down. A few months later, I received a call from my dad around 2.30 in the morning. I jolted awake at the sound of my ringtone going off. I lived in a solo room, so I didn't have to worry about waking up a roommate. My brother was in the hospital. They weren't sure if he was going to make it. Immediately, I grabbed my things and jumped in my car right away. It was a miracle that I made it home safely.
sure she had nothing to say to me anyway. I can't remember the events that unfolded afterward. I was in shock. All I wanted to do was stop existing. Dad was still nowhere to be found, and now the police were looking for him. I didn't know what else to live for now. I've been busting my ass to keep a roof over our heads. I gave up on my dreams, my future. All for what? To be left with my mother's medical bills. I was lucky that some distant cousin was willing to take care of the funeral for me, but I was broken. When I went home, it was early in the morning. The sun was just barely rising. I stood at the front door for God knows how long. My mind was blank. My stomach was aching from the lack of food and my dry heaving. For a second, I almost expected my brother to be there. I finally stepped foot in the house and truly saw the state of ruin it was in. Trash was littered everywhere. Cobwebs were in every corner. It was a crypt for my family, and I was the only one standing in it. I could hardly leave the living room, but I looked in all the rooms. I didn't have the heart to witness the downfall of my family or my life. My feet eventually led me to the last room of the house, my dad's office. The double doors were still closed from the last time he was in there, which was I don't know how many months now. The golden handles glinted in what light seemed through the curtains in the hallway. It was like staring at the sun. I felt like I couldn't open the door, but before I could second guess myself, I quickly pushed the handles and the doors opened. They slammed back and bounced against the wall. I felt a huge weight come off my shoulders, and I took a deep breath to fill my lungs. The rancid stench of death burnt the hairs in my nose. If I wasn't as far gone as I was, I knew I would have thrown up then and there. I didn't even bother to wrinkle my nose as I stepped into the room. There was a fine layer of dust on everything, but besides that, it was the cleanest room in the house. I assumed that a raccoon or something must have died in the walls or attic. Despite the smell, everything was as I remembered. As I threaded through the room, the smell only got worse. I did my best to follow the scent, as awful as it was. I walked behind my father's desk, where it immediately became worse. It seemed to be coming from the ceiling. I got on my knees, thinking it was coming from the floorboards. It was coming from behind me. I turned around to face the trunk that belonged to my dad. I won't lie to you, I was freaked out. I don't know what he could have put in there. There wasn't a lock on it, just a simple latch. I reached over and flicked it open. The smell stopped at once. There didn't seem to be anything special in the surface layer. There were just small books and photo albums from when I was younger. I took a moment to pick one up and flip through it. It wasn't long before I regretted that decision. There was a photo from 2010 during Christmas, and all of us were there smiling into the camera. My brother looked so young, and Mom was gussied up despite it being around 8 in the morning. I closed the album as a tear dropped down on the page. I shuffled the trunk, finding old bills, birth certificates, and passports. Then I stumbled across a Ziploc bag, one that was all but forgotten from my memory. I picked it up and stared long and hard at what rested inside. The bear paw that my father brought home with him before I went to college. It didn't look like it had aged a day. The bone fragments were still together. There was a sudden rush of wind, carrying the scent of rain with it. I had no clue where it would be coming from with the windows closed. Trees creaked loudly against the brute force. My hair was whipping all around like I was caught in the middle of a tornado. A sharp ringing deafened me. I dropped the ball to the ground and covered my ears, but that didn't do anything. I collapsed to the floor waiting for this horrid event to end, closing my eyes like that would hide me from what was happening. As suddenly as it started, it stopped. Picture frames fell to the floor, and the stuff that covered the desk dropped around me. I slowly opened my eyes, afraid of what I'd see. To my luck, there was nothing. Then he turned around, and for the briefest second, there was something, someone, standing over me. As soon as I blinked, the bones dropped in front of me and the figure was gone. The rotten stench of decay returned once again. I picked up the bones. The baggie they were in was gone, and as I held them, they seemed to... They seemed to be holding on. 
I rushed to the office and ran straight to the garage. I grabbed my dad's hiking bag and started to fill it with stuff I would need for my journey. A flashlight, plenty of spare batteries, food, and drink. I felt like I knew exactly what I had to do. I wrapped the ball, the hand, in a handkerchief and stowed it away in the bag. I held my breath as I stepped into the house one last time and went to the living room where my dad had hung up the photos he took that day. I nicked the photo of the waterfall and rushed back outside. I couldn't stand to be in that place any longer. The drive to the state park was only about an hour, but it seemed to pass in mere moments. I haven't been here since elementary school, but everything looked exactly as I remembered. The waterfall would be a good ten miles from where I parked, so I got walking. I was hoping that I'd make it there before nightfall. It was still before noon, so there was a chance. As I walked, I didn't see any signs of life. There were no other hikers, even the birds were silent. It would have been peaceful if, if it weren't for the increasing weight in my bag. Each mile I walked, it seemed to get heavier. My brakes kept happening more frequently the longer I walked. I've been sick and tired long enough, so I forced myself to push through. I'd be lucky to make it to the waterfall before dark. With about two miles left, I could hear the falls in the distance. It was a constant rush of noise, one that haunted my dreams for months on end. My clothes were soaked with sweat, and my legs were absolutely killing me. I was never one to believe in magic or the supernatural. Hell, maybe this was just a coincidence, but in my heart, I knew that my brother's death, my mom, my father's waning psyche, all of it had to be connected to the, to the day he took the hand from its resting place. When I finally arrived at the falls, the sun was fading fast. I gratefully dropped my back to the earth and pulled out the hand in the photo my father had taken. I was certainly in the right place, but the falls were big. The waterfall itself was over a hundred feet tall, and the pool that the water poured into was deep and stretched wide. When Dad came there, there had been a drought because the water was much deeper than the photo showed, and a hell of a lot more colder than I could have imagined. I placed the photo back in my bag and pulled out my flashlight. I didn't think I could let go of the hand if I wanted. Even with only three fingers, it was holding on tight enough to leave a bruise, I was sure. I clicked the light on and aimlessly thought of where I should begin. I couldn't go diving. Not only did I not have the equipment, but the strong currents would pull me under and I didn't plan on joining the poor soul to whom I was connected. I started by walking to the base of the falls, looking straight up at the white current as it pummeled against rock and misted the air. I was shivering soon enough. I looked up and down the rock face, searching for any sign of... I don't know what. I did my best to think about where Dad would have found wherever the remains came from. I knew that there was more to this, why this curse was on my family. In the heart of this forest, all I could hear was the rush of water. I paused on the embankment that I was on, staring at the pool in front of me. The bones tugged at my hand as they became heavy as lead. I barely took a breath as my body slammed into the water. My muscles seized me. I was never one for cold water, and with it being dark, I didn't know my eyes were closed until my hands crashed against slick rocks. The water stung my eyes as I opened them. My flashlight left my hand. I pushed against the earth and, sh and stood. The water came up to my chest after I was done flailing. The flashlight shined brightly at my feet. I took a deep breath and bent over. I opened my eyes once more and grabbed the light. I nearly sucked in water as I choked on my gasp. Even with the water blurring my vision, I know exactly what I saw. Hidden away from the sky above, I saw the hand, and with it a vague illusion like it was reaching out for me. Hidden under the sediment, enveloped with roots, plants, and growing algae, a skeleton of a young child was reaching out for help. Only now, years later, did they finally grab hold. I pushed myself to the surface once more and walked to dry land. I sobbed and sobbed, and in pauses for breath I could hear the birds and the crickets once more. I spent the night in those woods, thinking of my family. I fell asleep as soon as I submerged myself in my sleeping bag. At first I didn't know if I should leave the mystery of the child be, but having heard the rushing sound of water in my nightmare 
years in these last months. I thought they too should be free from that. When I told the police that there was a body at the falls, they were hesitant to react. But in time, they were able to recover the body. The boy was about 13 and was declared missing 25 years ago. The injuries on the boy suggested he fell from the falls and broke his legs and a few ribs. He couldn't swim, so he drowned. His name was Brian Overhill. His father went missing the same day, leaving Brian's mother without her husband and without her son. She would tell the cops that they went hiking and never came back. I never saw my father again. Brian's mother wanted to meet me, the news wanted to interview me, and there were even talks of a documentary about the missing case. I would never be able to tell them the truth, that my dad brought home something dark with him and that it took three lives in return. I've since sold the house and been doing my best to take care of myself, but there are still some nights. I feel myself drowning. I don't think that'll ever leave me. But for now, I try my best to keep my head above the water. That one is pretty serious. Kind of an air of hope at the end. Hope you're not too creeped out because we have one more story to go. One last creepy, spooky story for you before you drift off to sleep. This story is called The Kitchen Drawer by John Douglas Rainey. Dear Thomas, know this. I love you, brother. I'm not sure what you'll find waiting for you on the kitchen counter besides this notebook. Hopefully nothing. But it wouldn't hurt to check under the floor to make sure a finger or two isn't rolled under the counter. You and I have just hung up the phone, and you're on your way here. This gives me enough time to write this letter and finish what I've started. I want you to understand that I only threatened to burn this place down with me inside it to force you to come. It was the only way I could get you to leave the city and drive to the farmhouse. You would have thought I was mad if I told you over the phone that I solved the mystery as to why no one has ever found Mom's body. The answer lies within the kitchen drawer. Of course, I'll be gone too by the time you're here. I'd say goodbye in person, but for me, I accept my current physical state as a steady process of my own doing over the past 24 hours. For you, seeing me, or should I say what's left of me, will be a frightful shock. As you know, Carol and the kids moved in with their new boyfriend last year. What you don't know is that my life has spiraled downward ever since. Or maybe it started long before her affair did. She says I drove her and the kids away. Probably true. The ones we're closest to always see us crashing long before we even realize we're in a tailspin. Not long after they left, I lost my job, stopped paying my bills, stopped socializing, regrettably even with you. I stopped everything. Well, not everything. The bottle has become my companion. I guess I'm more like dad than I ever wanted to be. So. Of course, I was drinking when Carol showed up at my apartment and demanded that I sign the divorce papers. That didn't go well at all. The bottle made sure of that. So I fled and came here. As far as I can tell, no one has been inside since we were removed and placed in the boys' home. Sad to think that this house never got a second chance at having a happy family. As bleak as our childhood was, I still pictured our home in the fair condition. Mom kept it during our youth. So when I arrived here two days ago, I was dismayed to see how decrepit it had become. Weather damage and the corrosion of time have plagued the roof and the wooden frame, making it look sickly. In fact, the surrounding neighborhood looks bad, as if the atrocity spread from our house and infected the whole town. And as you can see, the inside is worse. No electricity, no water, filth, mold the stench of abandonment pollutes the air. The wooden floors are rotted, the painted walls are chipped, and the wallpapered ones are peeling. I didn't look around much since there 
isn't a lot I want to reminisce about. No, drunk as I was, my purpose was unclouded. I entered the kitchen, fettered with rat turds and cobwebs, and was almost disappointed to find the outside of the kitchen drawer decayed with its steel handle rusted. However, I did get the shock I was expecting when I opened the drawer. Empty. Clean. Unchanged with time. Look for yourself, Thomas, but I warn you, do not put anything in the drawer. Not yet. With great curiosity, I examined the drawer. First, I tried to take it out by sliding along its tracks, but the drawer does not want to come out. Then, I felt along the inside of the cabinet, and every inch of it was sturdy and smooth. I looked closely at the metal wheels and slides and found them shiny and unscathed, so it makes no sense that the drawer is irremovable and even more illogical that it should be in such great condition after two decades of neglect. Then again, as you might recall, this drawer does have a history. Mom would always complain that the cabinet was too darn big to keep important papers in. Nevertheless, it became the one place in the house where she and Dad put all kinds of stuff. And it was Mom used to say that the drawer ate the stuffing. Bills, letters, pens and pencils. Whenever Dad was furious about a bill or anything of pertinent information getting lost, Mom would swear that she put it in the drawer, and now it's gone. Dad would beat her. Later on, she would tell us that the drawer ate whatever she got punished for losing. We'd agree, but how awful it must have been for Mom to feel patronized by her own children while nursing black eyes and swollen lips. Harden your heart, dear brother, for you must read the words you've never permitted me to speak in person. In respecting your wishes, I have kept a dark secret that not even Carol, nor the police who interrogated us that night are privy to. For on the night that Dad killed Mom, I saw the drawer eat something. Dad and the bottle were hanging out all day when someone came to the farmhouse and gave him an envelope. You and Mom were upstairs. The man drove away and Dad opened the envelope right in front of me. Since we were always poor, my eyes must have opened as wide as Dad's at the sight of all that cash. It was the first time I saw two things. One hundred dollar bills. And Dad's smile. He was jubilant as he counted five thousand dollars out loud. Keep in mind this wasn't a share in a moment between us. I was a witness. He was too drunk to see me sitting at the corner of the table doing my homework. I watched him tuck the cash back inside the envelope and go over to the kitchen cabinet. He opened the drawer, pulled it inside, and closed it. Then he went back in the living room to share the news with the bottle and call someone on the house phone. Mom came downstairs and started doing dishes. I swear to you, brother, she did not open that drawer. But when Dad hung up the phone and returned to the kitchen, the first thing he did was open it. His face said it all. The rage was like a switch that had been flipped on. Dad threw everything out of the drawer until there was nothing left. He accused her of stealing his money. She didn't have a clue to what he was talking about. That didn't stop him from hurting her. Eventually, Dad noticed me. I suffered a few blows as I was also forced to deny stealing the money. He sent me up to my room, and there I stayed like a coward as Mom fought for her last breath. I've always admired you for sneaking out of your bedroom window, going to the neighbors and calling the police. I'm glad Dad got caught. Literally, red-handed, blood all over himself on the saw he used to presumably dismember her, and blood all over the kitchen everywhere except inside the drawer. The cop said it was as if Dad had a plastic bag in that drawer that he kept putting body parts in, but they never could determine where the body parts went from there. Mom was gone, every single part of her. Only the stain of the crime remained, which is sadly ironic because she hated a messy kitchen. Mom would have cringed at the notion of one day being reduced to a blood stain. Dad was drunk during his confession, but it was still admissible in court when he told the officers on the scene that he killed his wife in a fit of rage. He never admitted to dismembering her, despite all the blood evidence. Her bloody clothes were found on the kitchen floor when he asked 
Lloyd disposed of her body from the original confession to his dying words in a prison hospital, he always gave the same response. You wouldn't believe me if I told you. Yesterday I woke up on the rotted kitchen floor, having passed out drunk on my first night back in 26 years. I immediately went out and caught another bottle. Just like Dad. I came back here to the scene of the crime and the bottle I opened up our souls. Why didn't I try to save Mom? Did Dad do what I think he did with her body? Does the drawer really eat stuffing? Bills. Letters. Pens and pencils. Flesh. Bones. Organs and hair. After going mad of questions, the bottle and I conducted an experiment. I took a pair of scissors I found, a rock from outside, my vehicle registration from the car, and I put all three items in the drawer. I closed it for a mere second before yanking the drawer back open. Paper. Scissors. No rock. Dumbfounded, I examined the drawer. Then I closed the cabinet and opened it again. Scissors. No paper. I closed and opened it a third time. Empty. Not to sound insensitive, but giving the subject matter, I was excited because I proved Mom right. The drawer does eat stuffing. It eats when it chews by being, op by being opened and closed. If you have more than one thing in there when you open and close the drawer, something's going to get chewed up. If there's only one item inside, then that item will be eaten. That's why the police never found Mom's body. Because Dad cut her up into pieces and helped the drawer chew her up. Sorry to be so crude. I bet it started his cruel revenge. I'm sticking a part of her in the drawer. He must have been shocked when that part disappeared. Then maybe he put a second piece of her inside out of stubborn disbelief. When it happened again, I gather he saw it as a means to hide the evidence of his crime. So mom became stuffing. The drawer eats whatever you feed it, even if it's something dead. Call it supernatural, call it divine, call the drawer whatever you want, but it is a living thing. The magnitude of this extraordinary realization gave me a strange rush. I actually smiled for a moment, like dad did when he saw that cash. And just like dad, my mood quickly soured when I heard banging at the front door and the sound of Carol yelling. As I confess, bear in mind, brother, that I have been drinking all day, and Carol's become the person I hate most in the world, post out staff to liver cancer. So when she tracked me down to her childhood home and barged inside, I felt like a trapped animal under attack. Well, it is here that I wholeheartedly admit to feeling a surge of alcohol-fueled rage course through my veins as I wanted to stuff those divorce papers in the drawer, close it, and make room for more stuffing. Filled with anger, I moved toward her, and then it caught the corner of my eye from across the room. I turned to look, and saw it clearly from the sunlight piercing through the dirty window. A blood stain on the counter. A mom stain. Mom. I hugged Carol, signed the divorce papers, and asked her to tell the kids that I love them. She left confused but gratified. I have never succumbed to violence, and I never will. I guess I'm not like Dad after all. It made me realize that I probably didn't need to drink like Dad did either. Invigorated, I grabbed the bottle and headed for the drawer. I slammed the bottle inside and shut it. I was drunk, mind you, as my four fingers were inside the drawer when I closed it. I felt a tap. Nothing more. I opened it. The drawer ate one of my fingers. The bottle was there. I had three of my four digits, but my middle finger was gone. There was no pain. The skin over the nub was smooth, as if my finger had been removed surgically and healed over. The reason I didn't freak out was because I was pissed off about it. I wanted my finger back, and I was drunk, so I did something stupid. I removed the bottle, and I stuck my whole hand inside. I shut the drawer on my hand with the desire to open it, and had my finger reattached. The slight tap near the base.
base of my thumb was subtle, but proved significant as the drawer considered my palm, thumb, and three remaining fingers as one stuffing. My hand was gone at the wrist. I stared in disbelief at the nub on the end of my arm. There wasn't any pain, but I'm pretty sure I was in shock as I rem shoved my arm inside the drawer and yelled for it to replace my hand right now. I drunkenly slammed the drawer close to my arm, and then I stood up. Yes, the drawer ate my arm. I used my other hand to feel the nub in my shoulder blade where my arm used to be connected. I remember it laughing and feeling dizzy, and then for the second time since I arrived, I passed out on the kitchen floor. When I awoke, there was a strange sensation of my missing limb. I could feel all of the fingers attached to my hand, which I felt reattached to my arm. I'm not talking about phantom limbs. I'm saying that wherever my arm was, it was whole again. I could touch my missing fingers together. I could snap with my middle and thumb, thumb and middle finger, which was the first part of me to go. And now it's back in place. I felt my missing hand crawl around a strange floor. Then I bent my arm at the elbow and felt the nub above my armpit where my arm ends. The drawer eats whatever you feed it, even if it's something alive. My revelation inclines me to believe that the drawer doesn't care whether you're dead or alive or in pieces. The end result is that it puts you together again, whole on the other side, wherever that is. It begs further questions. Did mom get reconnected piece by piece? And if so, maybe she got put back together alive. Well, dear brother, that is what I intend to find out. First, I retrieved this notebook and a pen from my car and sat down on the kitchen counter. Then I called you on my cell and turned my phone off as I wrote all this. You should be here shortly, as I have no reason to think you're not coming to try and save me from torching the place of me inside it. You were always the heroic one. And now it's time for me to go. One piece at a time. After all, some of me is already there, wherever that is. The rest of me is catching up, that's all. While seated on the counter, I stuck one foot inside the drawer and closed it. I felt a mere tap and nothing more. I lifted my leg up and stared at the ankle nub where my foot used to be. I wiggled my missing toes and could feel them moving around somewhere, waiting for me. To say it's been challenging would be an understatement, but I've managed to maneuver around well enough to help the drawer eat me. After I fed up my other foot, I stuffed my legs in the drawer one at a time until my legs were gone from my knees down. Then I kind of slid down into the drawer up to my belly button. I used my only remaining hand to pull myself and the drawer closed. I felt a pep on my lower body and then suddenly I was falling. Thankfully, my hand caught the edge of the sink and I was able to pull myself back onto the counter. I am half a man, from stomach to head, with but one arm to finish this letter and lower myself down into the drawer. Then I will stuff myself inside and pull the cabinet closed, returning with the rest of me. Then I will stuff myself inside and pull the cabinet closed, reuniting with the rest of me. Again, may I remind you to check the flutter of fingers in case I lose one closing the drawer, and if so, be a sport and toss them in one at a time. I'd hate to be incomplete wherever I'm going. If I'm right, and mom is there, I'll tell her you love her. Who knows? You might even decide to come join us. Arthur. Dear Arthur, thank you for writing this letter. I'm sorry that your final attempt didn't go as successfully as you certainly hoped. Your hand was crawling around the floor when I entered the kitchen. I screamed and stomped on the hand several times. Sorry about that. I hope it didn't hurt you too bad, wherever you are. I wonder if you were consciously controlling your hand when it grabbed hold of my shoe, or was it instinctually grasping?
See you later in your dream.